Hello, attendees in listen-only mode. Before we start, and I officially welcome you and introduce Dr. Pryor. I don't know where you happen to be from. You can indicate that. And questions along the way in the place that says questions. Uh, but we're curious as to where you are from. So if you're from way far away, let us know. We'll give you something special. No, not really. I'm thinking about it really because my hay fever is really bad today. In Chicago, where I'm at, this is our fifth day, maybe, of consecutive 90-degree weather with fairly high humidity, especially today. It's supposed to cool off tomorrow, but I guess if you're in the Pacific Northwest, you're laughing at me saying, ha, 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 that's nothing. <laughs> Look at what I had. And and actually, you know, the, the downside of that, aside from the very serious issue of fires is another serious issue for all of you who are probably here. And that would be uh, dogs reportedly, there's no CDC for pets, uh, that have died of heat stroke uh, as a result of being outside for lengthy periods of times at times uh, where people, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, aren't accustomed to understanding okay, my dog really can't do well in this weather, combined with dogs not being acclimated to anything like that in their lifetimes, as all of you weren't. But it's not only the Pacific Northwest, it's throughout the rest of the country, we're hearing more anecdotal reports. I just talked to a veterinarian yesterday that treated not one, not but two dogs uh, for heat stroke, and sadly, they didn't come in soon enough, and the dogs didn't make it. So uh, I have a story about all that on my website, stevedale.tv and my name is Steve Dale and I'm here to welcome you to another Every Cat Health Foundation webinar. Those of you who are veterinary professionals you will be receiving race credit for this if indeed you so desire. Those of us who just joined us that have no idea what I'm talking about when I talk about race credit you could get it too if you were a veterinary professional uh, that's how high level this is, but hopefully, uh, and I believe certainly knowing Dr. Pryor, in a way that all of you will understand. I know for each and one, every one of these, we have uh, cat fanciers on, and we uh, thank the International Cat Association, TICA, and the Cat Fanciers Association for their support uh, throughout the years, not to mention their support for each and every one of these webinars. But this one in particular is being supported by Merck Animal Health. Uh, I am personally grateful for my long-standing relationship with my good friends at Merck, and Every Cat Health Foundation is grateful as well. Every Cat Health Foundation, for those who don't know, is unique among organizations on the planet. I don't think, and we've done some research here, we don't believe at Every Cat there's an organization that exists, aside from ours, solely to on cat health studies. And if you have a cat, if you've ever seen a cat, if you've ever known a cat, if you've ever watched a cat on television, that cat, your cats, everything we know about them very nearly in some way over the past 53 years or so has been touched by this organization. I mean, truly, it is quite incredible from our more recent ability to say FIP is no longer no longer officially considered fatal, I'm talking about feline infectious peritonitis, but is now considered potentially treatable. Wow, well, that's research we have funded over actually many decades uh, from uh, investigators from around the world, most notably Dr. Niels Peterson at the University of California, Davis. Uh, even a bit of what we know about cytozoonosis, uh, in fact, a lot, I should correct myself, and I will. A lot of what we know about uh, cytozoonosis was early on in particular. People didn't even know what was going on with these cats. Uh, that I'm sure Dr. Pryor will talk about cytozoonosis and explain exactly what I'm talking about, but everything we know and knew, especially to identify what was going on at the beginning, funded by what was then the Wind Feline Foundation. So I need to explain this as well. Uh, just a few months ago, we have, as they say in the biz, rebranded. So what was the Wind Feline Foundation for over 50 years is now the Every Cat Health Foundation. We thought, I thought, 
the education committee thought, uh, which I co-chair with Dr. Vicki Thayer, that this topic is really important. And one can argue uh, with climate change, it is becoming increasingly important. Uh, Dr. Pryor could comment on this. I've said this many times that there's an epidemic of tick disease across this country. And that's been going on a couple of years. Is epidemic too strong a word? I'll let Dr. Pryor comment on whether that's the case or not. But certainly we're seeing more of it in more places, affecting dogs, affecting people, but affecting cats as well. Uh, by the way, we hope you go to everycat.org. Really hope you go there uh, to investigate uh, whatever you'd like, information about cats, cat health, and hopefully support us through the process because we can't do our work. And I'm just a lowly board member. I'm not paid to do anything. I'm here <laughs> because I know the difference that this organization has made historically, which I could talk about for hours, and continues to make, which I'm very proud of. Now, on to Dr. Pryor. You'll note, first of all, that he talks funny. He's the only person that I know who has an Australian Tennessee accent. Okay, this is what I was trying to get to here. This is really important. Then I'll get back to Dr. Pryor's introduction, I promise. So, yes, thank you for joining us, but we hope you do this. You text this phone number, 833-985-2287. Virginia will leave that slide up for a moment anyway. So you could write down that number if you want and consider donating. This event, all of our webinars are free. They're going to be that way. But having said that, if you are so moved, who have seen one or two of these in the past and think, you know what? This is at least a $3.80 value. I hope you donate $3.80 or ideally much more. All right, well, I introduced Dr. Pryor, at least for a moment, I hope the slide remains here. I thank you, uh, Ginny Rudd of the Every Cat Health Foundation for helping us with all of these webinars, doing all the technical things that she does. Oh, so very, very well. Lucky to have Virginia. Okay, Dr. Pryor. The only person I know with a Tennessee Australian accent, uh, he is in fact at uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. He's the former owner and partner of three, not one or two. He's an overachiever, Blue Pearl Emergency Hospitals. That's in Middle Tennessee, which might be in the middle of Tennessee. He'll tell us a 37 year old, a 37 year old veteran. Okay, I'll read it that way. A 37 year, take it, you know. Dr. Yeah. Pryor's professional interests include all aspects of small animal medicine and surgery. Uh, and he came to the United States. He'll tell us that story, maybe. That's an amazing story. Dr. Pryor is board certified member and past president of the Companion Animal Parasite Council. This organization, capcvet.org, if you want to cheat and look at the veterinary side of this. Uh, this organization, I think, and I'll say it publicly again, I've said it before, does better at tracking parasites than the Center for Disease Control. I mean, truly an incredible organization. And I know how much he cares about the organization. I'm talking about the Companion Animal Parasite Council. I know how much he cares about our pets. And here he is, I've gone on long enough and he's thinking, get on with it. So I do. Here's Dr. Pryor. Steve, as always, thank you so much for your kind words. I really appreciate it. And yes, I'm an Australian living in Tennessee. So to everyone, g'day, y'all. So that last bit, I don't know, my kids shudder every time I say it. So uh, glad to be here with you all. Um, got a lot to talk about today. I know that we've got a mixed audience here of veterinarians and non-veterinarians. So I'll try not to, I'll try to make sure that I um, explain things well to both audiences and hopefully engage both audiences as well. So. Um, we're going to talk a lot about parasites. So, you know, bottom line, parasites are dynamic and ever-changing, and parasites are on the move, and that's the bottom line. We need to understand that. And, you know, uh, indoor cats, people sort of say, well, she's an indoor cat. He's an indoor cat. We don't have to worry about him. Well, you know, I think we do. And I'm going to give you lots of good reasons for that. And, you know, the the um, we don't live in bubbles. 
you know, the indoors goes outside and the outside comes inside and it all gets mixed up. And really there's no way to stop stuff that's outside getting in your house unless you absolutely live in a vacuum seal bubble. So we need to understand what's going on out there. And so I'm here to show and share a lot with you as far as that goes. So uh, I'll remind you all that we'd love you all to donate to Every Cat Foundation. It's a wonderful, wonderful organization. Um, but I'm gonna bring up some polls here. So Virginia, you wanna throw up some polls for us? Um, and what do I need to do anything, Virginia? I hope not. Nope, just I'll close it when it's ready. Okay, so let's let's do some polls here and see what answers we get. And Virginia is going to jump on here and tell us the answers as soon as they close out. You better okay. say polls. I actually don't even see the polls. All right, you got 96% say that's false. Well done. What was the question? True or false, indoor only cats don't get parasites. 96% say false, yay, I love that. Okay, correct. Indoor cats get lots of different things. Actually, there was a case in Chicago a couple of years ago where they, uh, two indoor cats, uh, I think they were living on the 11th floor of a high rise, uh, the owners have said that the cats are indoors only, so they didn't have to need to do anything for the cats. And they came home one day and found that the two cats were out on the balcony playing with a dead bat. <gasps> true story. The uh, They had the bat tested. The bat was positive for rabies. So both these cats that have never had any vaccines because they were totally indoors had to be quarantined for six months. Devastating. Absolutely devastating for the owners and for the more More importantly, devastating for the cats being locked up for six months had no choice. So yes, indoor cats get stuff. And we'll talk a lot more about that. What's the next poll do we have? The next poll is, is your cat currently on year round heartworm or parasite preventative? My answer to that is absolutely. Okay, well. Still getting responses. And we're being sponsored by Merck today. So we are going to talk about a parasite preventive and you know good reasons to use it and why it's uh, it's worthwhile using. So um, I'll just you know fill you up to date on that. Why we why I choose what I choose, why I think the way I think. All right, got results ready? Yes. 52% answered that question wow. yes 34 Good. said no and unfortunately 14 percent selected sadly i don't have a cat okay so that's above the 54 percent that's above the national average uh national average is about four percent so uh, you know we're getting somewhere people are becoming more educated about the risk to their their, their cats so uh, i'm glad to hear that i'd, I'd love to have seen that 100 percent, but hey it's getting better on the right track so what's the last poll we have Last one is, is your cat currently on a monthly tick preventative? Ticks, nasty little critters. <laughs> oh yes, ticks are just, they're, you know, it's not just the ick factor, you know, ticks have that wonderful ick factor. They're just ugly little beasts, but we shouldn't be worried so much about the tick as what the tick carries. That's what you've got to worry about. And I'll curl your toes a little bit on this one. So how are we doing that, Paul? All right, we're going to go ahead and close it. And our numbers are people that said, yes, their cat is currently on a monthly tick preventative is 30% only. No is 55% and the same 14, 15% said that they don't have a cat. Okay, so we'll talk about why we should have ticks on tick preventive. So let's move on here. So why, you know, where do your indoor cats contract ticks? So, you know, boarding 
it's a house by another pet. Many people have a cat and a dog or a couple of cats and a couple of dogs or whatever. There's a whole mix there, but you know, they're brought in by other pets. And I've got, I have at this point, we've thinned the ranks a little bit. I'm down to one dog and one cat and my dog and cat live in very, very close contact with each other. They're very good friends. They love to snuggle together. So, and my dog goes outside a lot and I'm in a wooded area. Uh, you know, we live as a society, we're living closer and closer with nature. Um, and we're encroaching upon nature and nature's encroaching upon us. And so we're getting closer contact with ticks, with wildlife. And so my dog will bring in, in, in ticks. My, my cat is not a totally indoor cat. I, where I live is very quiet. And in my backyard, my cat has a little area that it goes out in about once a day and it's out there supervised and comes back in. But my cat can come in with ticks as well. So cats can bring them in. Dogs will often bring them in. We can bring them in. Okay, we go out. I mean, I take my dog on walks every day and I come back and I do a tick check of my dog every day. I do a tick check, tick check of myself every day. And even then I miss ticks. I actually was pretty gross, but I got it was getting in bed the other night and I lay down. I was lying there quietly and suddenly felt like I had something crawling on me. I looked down. Yes, I had a Lone Star tick on me. Did I bring it in? Did my dog bring it in? I don't know, but it got in and it found us. Ticks are very savvy. Um, they'll come in on rodents. So, you know, um, ticks are a three. So I'm going to talk about the different uh, ticks we encounter out there. And there's many different ticks. There's many, many species of ticks. Most of the ticks we encounter in the U.S. have a three host life cycle. So what does that mean? It means that the tick during its life stage is on three different hosts. So to give you an example, a tick, a female tick will quest. And so when they quest, they actually climb up on grass, they climb up on bushes, they hang on with their back legs, and they're feeling with their front, they're looking for a host to grab onto so that they can have a blood meal. And they will get on different hosts. So different ticks like different hosts, but you know, at the end of the day, they're not that selective when they're looking for a free meal. And so that female tick will get onto a host and have a blood meal, and it could be a rodent, could be a a squirrel, it could be a deer, it could be a human, it could be a dog, it could be a cat, and they'll have that blood meal. And then the female, once she's engorged, will after a couple of days will drop off and she will lay in the environment anywhere from on average from two to six thousand eggs, two to six thousand eggs. Some of them up to eighteen thousand eggs. Those eggs then hatch out to the next life stage, which is the larval stage. And the larval stage climbs up on long grass bushes and quests and looks for a different host. And then it will get on it. It will have a blood meal, eventually engorge. It will eventually drop off. And then it will become eventually the nymph stage, which will then quest, get on yet a different host again, has a blood meal, eventually engorges and drops off, becomes the adult, repeat, repeat, repeat. So three different life stages. And when you look at that, these ticks in all spend only about 10% of their life on the hosts. And uh, the average tick can live over four years. So over three years of that life is spent off the host and there's different hosts. So they can come in on rodents. They can come in on birds because so, birds are one of the life stages and lizards can be one of the life stages as well. Lots of houses live in areas where you get lizards as well. And then people move and you can move into a new house and there can be ticks in there. So uh, the brown dog tick, just Google that on YouTube and you'll see where you've got infestations. That's the tick that likes to live in houses, in kennels. And you'll actually see some videos where you get swarms of them coming out of furniture, out of the backs of, of couches or from drop ceilings. It's disgusting. And that's, they get in places who you wouldn't normally test, uh, see. So the Lone Star tick, um, the Lone Star ticks on the move, parasites are dynamic and ever changing. It's always been sort of considered a Southern tick, but it's moving up the Eastern seaboard. It's moving up into Maryland. It's moving up into the Northeast. It's on the move. It's moving up to Ohio areas. It hasn't been seen before. And, you know, I come back to um, when you look at these ticks, they're all three host life cycle. And at the end of the day, ticks don't feed 365 days of the year, but there is always a life stage of a tick feeding 12 months of the year. There is no tick season. Tick season is year round in the United States. And it's it's not so much the tick you worry about, it's the pathogens that they transmit. So we've got the Lone Star tick, uh, we've got a leukiosis, we've got rickettsiosis. And, and a lot of these are 
uh, are, are actually uh, the the vector borne these vector borne diseases are actually zoonotic. So rickettsiosis affects humans as well. Tularemia. Uh, it occurs in cats. Cytoxazoonosis occurs in cats. And we've got STARI, which is the southern tick associated rash illness. The lone star tick is also the one that, that, that transmits the meat allergy as well. And you hear a lot more about people that, that get bitten by a lone star tick have these sudden, very acute, very devastating meat allergies. They can't eat meat anymore. Um, and, and it's just, it, you know, for a steak eaters, it's devastating. Um, for a lot of others, it may not be. Uh, if you're already a vegan, but it's it's something that's out there. You've got the Gulf Star uh, Coast ticks. So there's over 12 different ticks that affect just dogs and cats, and there's more than those in the United States. But you know the Gulf Coast tick, obviously its habitat is where you hear more go uh, in the Gulf states, but it's moving as well. Ticks are on the move. So hepatozoonosis and then rickettsiosis as well. American dog tick, very, you know, the name of the uh, of it, American dog tick. Don't let that fool you. This is one of the more common tick uh, ticks of cats, and it transmits Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And again, tularemia, which can affect cats as well. And Rocky Mountain spotted fever fever affects humans as well. So, so many of these things are uh, affect humans as well. We call this zoonosis, and it's not true zoonosis, but it's got to go through the tick. But uh, it is something that we need to be truly aware of. Now, the Rocky Mountain wood tick, obviously Rocky Mountain areas. If we get rickettsiosis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, tularemia, again, affecting cats. The Western Exodi specificus, which is the uh, Western black-legged tick or the deer tick. So you really got two populations, Exodi specificus and Exodi scapularis, one's in the West, one's on the East. But the Eastern one, the Exodi scapularis, talk about it in a minute, is on the move as well. So it transmits Lyme disease, devastating to dogs, devastating to humans, and can affect cats as well. And then anaplasmosis. Uh, and it's on the move. So the bigger one, Exodes scapularis, which is in the more on the eastern side of the U.S., uh, human it transmits human babesiosis, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, leukiosis, Borreliosis, powassan po virus, just to name a few. Okay, and parasites are dynamic and ever changing, and they're on the move. And Exodes scapularis is moving through the U.S. Uh, and this is the last one. I was, I'll talk about the brown dog tick. This is the one that likes to actually live in housing, in kennels. It likes to be inside. Uh, and that's the one that will get into roofs. It'll get into furniture. It's a nasty tick. Uh, it transmits all these, anaplasmosis, alichiosis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So all of them three host life cycle. And so, you know, unfortunately, because it's three host life cycles on three different hosts, we can't break the life cycle. We just have to kill it before it transmits disease. That's the key. We can't break the life cycle of tick, so kill it before it transmits disease, bottom line. Uh, so your feline tick-borne diseases, just to really summarize it for you, uh, Lyme disease, which is fairly rare in cats, but can occur. Hemobotanolosis, which is severe, uh, causes severe life-threatening anemias. Cytoxazoonosis used to be called bobcat fever because that was the reservoir host. And cytoxazoonosis tends to occur in little hot spots around the country. There's actually one very close to where I live, just a little bit north of me. And we sort of, when we're taking histories on these animals, and especially on sick cats, we ask them where they live because we want to, you know, it's one of the things you got a cat with a really high fever. We want to know if you're in that area, we got to consider it. So, causes severe anemia, fever, lethargy, breathing difficulties is is always being considered fatal. But they're actually seeing more and more cats are actually starting to survive it now, which is good. Chilaremia, ehrlichiosis is fairly rare, and babesiosis is fairly rare. But you know, uh, just because it's rare doesn't mean it doesn't occur. Okay, so. Companion Animal Parasite Council, we keep track. We look, look at, we have maps that we follow prevalence, but we've got so many uh, millions of data points now that we actually are now forecasting. We can forecast prevalence of disease. It's very, very cool. We actually use professors of statistics from a number of universities. We actually have to uh, rent Amazon servers to run our computations. They're so complex. And we come out with yearly forecasts. In fact, we actually have taken that one step further that we just don't do yearly forecast now on a national basis. We are now forecasting 30 days in advance on the county level, mainly for dog diseases, but it's still relevant because if I can show you the prevalence of ehrlichiosis, I'm showing you where the Lone Star Tick range is. And Lone Star Ticks will affect cats as well. 
So you've got exposure to not just your cat, but you've got exposure to humans as well. And you should be worried about that. So this is the baseline prevalence for ehrlichiosis over the last eight years. This is the where all the positive tests have come from, but this is what our forecast is for this year. And watch this. And you can see if I toggle back and forward, that the map is just lighting up red. And you can see that the range of the Lone Star tick is just expanding. Ticks are dynamic and ever changing. They're on the move. And as they move, they're taking their vector borne diseases with them. And so if this is the range for Lone Star ticks that's going to uh, spread the leukiosis, then you've got exposure to cats to ticks as well. Lyme disease, and this is important because Lyme affects humans as well. And we actually have a study out that shows that the prevalence of Lyme disease in dogs in your county, it's dogs are sentinel for the risk of human infection. So if there's 8% prevalence of Lyme in dogs in your county, there's an 8% risk of human developing, uh, developing Lyme in your county as well. So this is the baseline prevalence. This is our forecast. And you can see that the it's the spread of Lyme is just slowly oozing down out of the Northeast into, into coming down into the Southern states. That's because the ra expanding range of the black-legged tick is bringing Lyme disease with it as well. So, uh, you know, it's, it's important that we test and we prevent. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, uh, and then the last one I'll talk about is heartworm. It's not the last parasite I'll talk about. But we'll talk about heartworm disease. And let me remind everybody, it only takes one mosquito, just one. Just that one mosquito can prevent heartworm to your cat. But hey, my cat's an indoor cat. I shouldn't be worried about it, should I? Oh, yes, you should. You know, there's over 60, there's over 200 species of mosquitoes in, in the world. And there's over 60 of them that will spread heartworms. Well, we don't think about that, do we? And different mosquitoes have different types of habitats and they like different things. Well, there's a, a lot of mosquitoes I should prefer to feed indoors. Yeah, they like to be inside as well. We like to be inside. Yeah, there's certain species of mosquitoes like to be indoors as well. The mosquitoes will actually hang around um, the, the door jams and windows. And as soon as the things are open, door open, they'll fly in. They'll actually light on you and, follow, and, and get a free ride in your house. So, What's the prevalence out there of feline heartworms? Well, this is a CAPC map. So this is the Companion Animal Parasite Council. We actually track prevalence uh, of different parasites. This is our prevalence maps for feline heartworm antibody testing. Uh, and there's a lot, you know, we, we can get into the type of testing out there. I really want, don't have time to do that today. But this is the feline antibody testing. It shows nationwide there's a full 4% prevalence rate. So about one in 200 cats are showing up positive. Now, this is not the total number of uh, cats tested, and this is the, not the total number of cats in the United States, obviously. This is just the total number of tests that we have access to. The prevalence percentages are very accurate, but low prevalence does not mean no prevalence. If you don't look, you won't find. If you're not testing, you won't know. So the other test we look at is the antigen test. It's a little bit higher at 0.68%. Again, remember, low prevalence does not need mean no prevalence. So let's look at dogs because the dog tests are actually a little bit more accurate on prevalence rates. And this is, and it's really, I'm showing you the expanding risk that there is out there. And what I'm showing you here is where heartworm is throughout the United States. And it really, it's all across the country and throughout the whole country, but I'll, I'll show you good evidence on, on why we need to be worried about it. This is where all the positive tests are showing up in the last, eight, nine years. And you see it's predominantly in the southeastern the United States, but this is our forecast for this year. And you can see the whole map, if I toggle back and forth, is just lighting up. So if there's heartworm disease there in dogs, cats are going to get exposed as well. And you think about this, you've got if a, uh, uh, what's going on is we're getting massive relocation of animals out of the Southeast. There's a shortage of adoptable animals in the Northeast. There's a shortage of adoptable animals in Colorado, in California, in the Northwest. And so what's happening is they're, they're pulling these dogs out of the Southeast and they're relocating them across the country. Unfortunately, only one third of animal welfare organizations reportedly test for heartworm infection, treat or even provide heartworm prevention prior to transporting dogs. So what happens if you get a heartworm positive dog that shows up in a rescue, say in Colorado? Well, they're adopted out. And what do they tell you when they adopt that dog out? Take it to your veterinarian. And when do they take it into the veterinarian? Well, 
We don't know, but it could be in two days, it could be in two weeks, it could be in two months, it could be next year. We don't know. But if that dog is heartworm positive and that dog has circulated microfilaria, the baby heartworms, and that dog sits in someone's backyard, that dog is a positive source of potential infection or exposure for every animal in the range of the mosquito around that dog. And the average range of a mosquito is anywhere from 150 yards to a mile and a half. So if you've got a heartworm positive dog in a suburbia, every animal within about a mile and a half, the range of a mosquito, can be potentially exposed to heartworms. And what's the uh, prevalence rate in, in shelter animals? It's around 14 to 48%. I was actually in, uh, in uh, Houston, Texas a couple of years ago speaking at a One Health conference at Baylor down there. And I got to talk to the head of Harris County Humane Association, which is the big shelter in Houston. He actually said that that, percent, that, that prevalence rate's low in his area. It's over 60% in his shelter. So that's 60% of all dogs are positive for heartworms. And so you've got this massive exposure rate out there um, that, that's, that's happening. And that's why we're seeing the spread of heartworms all over the United States. So the bottom line is, we as veterinarians should no longer base heartworm testing and prevention recommendations on only historical heartworm risks and prevalence. We can't do that anymore because the risks have changed. The whole landscape has changed. Uh, parasites are dynamic and ever-changing and they're on the move and they're moving into your neighborhood. They're moving into your backyard. So can indoor cats get exposed to heartworms? The answer is absolutely yes. You know, um, this is actually a case of mine. This was a client of mine and she adopted this cat. This is a cat. Uh, he, she adopted him when he was four weeks of age. At that time, he became an indoor only cat. And he's five years of age when I saw him. And, the, and uh, since he was four weeks of age up until I saw him, and I used to see him on a regular basis, but until this, this time, he had only left his house on an occasional basis. And the only time he left the house through that front door was to come to our clinic. Totally indoors otherwise. She called me up one day and said, there's something crawling underneath the skin of my cat. And your first response is, that's kind of crazy. But I said, hey, let's take a look, bring him on in. So she brought him on in, we shaved him up, and I hope you can see my pointer here, but you could literally see a tract underneath the skin of this cat and it was moving you could see the skin of the cat underneath this thing was wiggling underneath the skin. And most people out there that, that, that aren't veterinarians go, that's kind of gross. And we as veterinarians go, well, that's kind of cool because it's something unusual and we want to go see what it was. So I said, let's go get it. So this is what we did. So we sedated the cat. He's under an anesthesia here. We made a small incision and we were able to grab it. And here it comes. This is a totally indoor cat, five-year-old, male neutered. And we pulled this thing out. This is an adult heartworm. In cats, heartworms do not always end up in the heart and lungs. They'll end up in other areas of the body. And we removed this. I said to the owner, I think this is a heartworm. <laughs> excuse me, we sent it off and have it, had it positively identified. And yes, it was a heartworm in a totally indoor cat. And the owner looked at me and said, well, you've never recommended heartworm prevention for my cat. And I said, oh, yes, we have. And I had it documented in the record that every time I'd seen her, I'd recommend that she put her cat on a monthly heartworm preventive. And she declined. And now she's a huge believer and she's a huge advocate for heartworm prevention in cats. What else is there out there? Well, we talked about ticks. We've talked about uh, heartworms. So let's talk a little bit about intestinal parasites as well. So uh, the prevalence of intestinal parasites, roundworms in cats is 3.78% on a nationwide basis. Uh, in hookworms is about 0.65%. Uh, Why do I mention roundworms and hookworms? Because I think it's incredibly important because they're zoonotic. What does zoonosis mean? It means that you can contract this from your cat. Okay. so a cat has roundworms or hookworms that shares the eggs in the stools, 
and you clean the kit litter box and you got to wear gloves and you got to disinfect and if you don't do it properly you could contract hookworms you could contract uh, roundworms uh, we hear about zoonosis every year from hookworms and roundworms uh, and it's something you need to be very concerned about and what you know why should we be worried about an indoor cat because indoor cats still get parasites, including intestinal parasites. Um, if you've got a, a, a cat that's a hunter and you get mice that come into your house uh, with the changes of the season and they hunt and they catch a mice and they eat it and you didn't know about it, they can contract roundworms. Um, they can get it from cockroaches. Lots of cats like to hunt insects. They can get it that way as well. There was a study done a few years ago where they looked at uh, soil from uh, just regular soil from non-dog parks, just uh, from greenways, from regular soil throughout the U.S. And they did around the world. They actually found in the U.S. That about 15% of soil contains parasitic elements. And we use soil for our indoor plants. And cats like to dig in indoor plants. And so they can contract it that way. Um, you know, my wife called me up the other day. She said, there's some type of worm hanging out my cat's butt. And I'm very diligent about my, my cat and I'm very diligent about preventives. And I just put it on, uh, uh, he'd got his Brevecto Plus two days uh, previously. And I said, don't worry. I said, that worm is dying. It's on its way out because uh, the medication did what it's meant to do, which is to eliminate intestinal parasites. So cats, indoor cats will get intestinal parasites as well. And we should be concerned about that. So let's talk a little bit about protection and how you protect your animals. And so uh, we're, you know, I'll preface this by we are um, sponsored by Merck, which makes Brevecto Plus. There are multiple preventives out there that you should use. This is the one I like. I'll tell you why. I'm going to go through why we should be using preventives and how it, you know, and how well they work and why, you know, why they're so good. And, um, you know, we're looking at Prevecto Plus has got two molecules, moxidectin. We've been using moxidectin in cats for over 10 years in the U.S., probably longer than that worldwide. Uh, Fluorolana for over three years in the U.S. It's been, Fluorolana itself has been out um, is since 2000, June 4th, 2004. 14 in the US, uh, been used on the dog side first. It's been worldwide uh, since that time as well. Um, and I like it because it's actually a two month product, not a one month product. And, you know, one of the biggest things we know is that cats hate when we deal, when we hold them down and we shove things down their mouth or we put things on them. They just hate it. It's stressful on them. It's stressful on, on us. And a lot of times I find that clients sort of go, you know, I just don't want to wrestle my cat. Well, what if we can do something less frequently? You know, less frequently is good. And so uh, this is actually a, uh, a, a five-way product. So uh, that actually is a extended duration. It actually, uh, you'll have to put on it about every two months. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about, about, about that as well. And now she makes it easier on everyone out there. So um, it is, it's less stress, it's increased protection. It's a two month flea and tick. It's actually a three month flea and tick because the Brevecto part, the Fluorolana is actually labeled um, in the, in the in just a straight Fluorolana part is actually labeled for a three month product. But um, the hot one part of this is actually um, labeled for two months and it treats for two months at a time for roundworms and hookworms. So you're getting protection against fleas, ticks, hotworms, hookworms, and roundworms. Five most common parasites in cats. What's not to like about that? Um, so flea kill. You know, the good thing about fleas is that fleas are obligate ectoparasites. Once a flea gets on its host, so a flea jumps on your cat, not that we want fleas to get on your animals, but the good news is when flea get, fleas get on a cat, a dog, they're obligate ectoparasites. They don't want to leave that host. That's where its free meal is. And that's where its whole life cycle happens. It's, it's, you know, the flea lays eggs that fall off in the immediate environment, they hatch out into the, the, the maggot-like larva stages that eventually spin the cocoon in the pupa stage, and then the hatches out, jumps on the pet again. It all happens right there in that, in that very close environment. But the good news is that because that adult flea doesn't like to leave its host, we can actually break the life cycle. And Fluorolana, which is in Brevecto, is incredibly effective at that, in fact, the the what we say the duration, uh, the 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 uh, the duration of where it acts, it actually acts longer than we actually probably realize it does. It's a very long-acting product, so we can actually 
firmly break that life cycle even just with one application and we want to use it you know we want we don't want to just do one application and call it good we want to continue to use that but we know we are going to break that life cycle and not have any more fleet problems and so this is the speed of kill and it looks at 20 12 hours and 24 hours out and you've got it the day zero when it's first applied it's a hundred percent for 12 hours, 24 hours. After one month, it's still at 100%. And then after two months, at the end of two months, it's still at 99 and 99.7%. That's how effective it is in breaking the flea life cycle. So that's the good news that we just don't have to deal with fleas anymore. And I love that because trust me, before we had products like this, when I first started practicing back in the 80s, flea problems were horrendous animals dogs cats were just miserable and our human owners were miserable because they saw their pets suffering and we can stop that suffering by using products like this um as far as ticks goes it looked at the two most common ticks in cats exodes scapularis and dermacenter uh which is the american dog tick and both of them were over 90 percent for two months uh, and so this is the data on the on the the two different ticks. So day zero, they were both at 100% on after application. After one month, at 100%, and then at two months, almost 100% for both of those. So very long duration of action. It really gives really broad spectrum protection. Um, and then as far as heartworms goes, it's 100% effective against heartworms, and that's really good. So you know. I get asked this all the time, is heartworm prevention really needed in cats? Well, you know, if you look at the, the data out there, juvenile worms, heartworms, you get a similar infection rate as in dogs. But unlike the dogs, in cats, you get increased risk of HARDS. And this is, um, HARDS starts is an acronym, an acronym that stands for Heartworm Associated Respiratory Disease. These cats get these really horrible asthma type symptoms and it really affects their quality of life. It really, uh, it's just horrible to see a cat with hives. They really suffer from this. And so this is one of the big things we can help prevent. Um, as far as the actual adult heartworm infection rate, it's about, call it an average of 10% of the rate of, of infection in unprotected, dog, unprotected dogs in a given area. So we don't see as high a level as in dogs. But remember, you know, even indoor cats at risk. But it, but remember, just one worm can kill your cat, just one, right? And then you got the problem with, unlike dogs, it's difficult to diagnose. Um, it, you know, it causes disease that can be life threatening. Just one worm can kill your cat. There's no good treatment. We can treat it in dogs. It's harsh to treat them. It's expensive to treat the dogs, but we can treat them. In cats, there's no good treatment. All we can do is treat symptomatically and just wait it out and hope that that, uh, that heartworm eventually dies and doesn't kill the cat in the process. <coughs> the good news is we can readily prevent this disease. We can readily prevent this uh, parasite. And you know it's recommended that we prevent it. The recommendations are actually out there by Companion Animal Parasite Council. We're the leading authority on parasites for veterinarians and for the general public. And so we have published guidelines out there for this saying that we should be preventing it. And the American Heartworm Society uh, recommends it as well. So uh, Prevective Plus also treats for, it actually treats, it doesn't prevent, it's actually a treatment for hookworms and roundworms. So it treats, eliminates the fourth stage larva, immature adults and, and the adults themselves. And its efficacy, again, is highly efficacious product. It does an incredibly good job for hookworms and roundworms so 100 percent nearly the whole way through for two months so this is the capsi recommendations expert recommendations that all cats should be treated year round and throughout their life with flea control products all cats should be treated year round and throughout their life with tick control products and all cats regardless of their lifestyle should be on year round heartworm prevention that's written CAPC guidelines that we publish for the general veterinary population. We're providing these guidelines for them. And so one thing I like about Brevecto Plus is it meets, one product will meet these guidelines and make life easier for everyone. Good news is they've done a lot of testing on it. There's no significant side effects um, in as young as nine to 13 year old kittens up to 
and they use, they tested up to five times the maximum label dose every eight weeks for three doses. They tested it incredibly safe. There was no significant side effects when, ma when one maximum daily dose was administered orally and there's no contraindications. And, and the, you know, I come back to why did they do this orally? Because what happens when you put something on a cat? They're going to try and lick it off. So they're going to turn around and they're going to ingest this. And that's why they did it that way. And the good news is there is no known contraindications for these products. And the nice thing is it is actually a, a extended duration. It actually is a two month. Uh, I think we're actually seeing data now that probably lasts longer than two months. And so, you know, there may be label changes in the future. I will mention this. Now put this slide in, and this is just an application slide, but I'll talk about this really in relation to any topical product you use on cats. You know, I hear, I've always heard, you know, uh, there, there, there are multiple products out there that are transdermal topicals that you put on topically and it's absorbed through the skin. And I've always heard comments from clients that, hey, it's, my cats hate it. In my experience, and I've been using these products ever since they first come out, in my experience, what I believe is going on, it's not the application itself. It's because we're trying to put it on too fast and so you get your cat you wrangle your cat you get your cat ready <clears throat> then you put the dose on and we want to get done with it really fast so we tend to really squeeze that product out really fast and what i found is when you squeeze that really fast you it doesn't matter what product you're using there tends to be a very high pitched sound associated with the squeezing of it out and what i found if we slow down the application and you just dribble it out slowly it doesn't make that high pitched sound and the cats don't react to it now, I'm not saying that happens in every case. Um, some cats will still react to a liquid on their back. But most, of, most times I've found it's the noise of the application that tends to make the cats freak out a little bit. So just slow down your application and I think you'll find it'll be less traumatic for your kitty cat. So biggest thing is, um, you know, extended duration tends to be the way to go. We know that with cats, the less often we have to wrangle them and put things on them, the better it is for them. So uh, this is a, a, a long acting, it's convenient to use, cost effective, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, bottom line is for the veterinarians out there is that there is a huge opportunity to improve healthcare for cats. And a lot of that is, you know, it, it starts with the parasiticides. So, you know, CAPC did a study and we found that nine out of 10 pet owners are concerned about, parasitis, uh, pa about parasites in their county. In fact, uh, three out of four of them would actually make an appointment with their veterinarian for further testing and discussion if they knew what the risk was. So by sharing risks of what's going on in your county, you can engage clients to come in and talk to you about what parasites are out there and how best to prevent more disease in cats. And we know that for a fact that only one in 20 cats on average leave a clinic with a broad spectrum parasite control. The good news is today on this, on this webinar, 54% of people are using parasiticides for the cats and I applaud you for that, it's wonderful. Um, in my hospital, I made this a priority years and years ago for our cats that I recommended that all cats be on a broad spectrum product to prevent heartworms and prefer preferably a product that treated hookworms, roundworms, and treat for fleas, ticks, and other parasites, if possible, year round. And I used to track all my compliance on it. So the national compliance rates we know are around 4%. They're increasing. They're actually getting into the teens now. But the percentage of cats when I first started doing it uh, in my clinic was only at 26%. And I actually followed it year over year. And I actually got my client base up to about 57%. And you'll see that I actually went to about halfway down. My numbers dropped from 54% down to 40%. And, you know, I looked at that and I was like, what's going on here? Well, that was the year that I did a big push to get more cats in the clinic. And I saw 35% more cats that year. That's why you see the 35% in brackets there. And so my compliance will drop and it's just a matter of educating clients. I mean, people need to be educated about the importance and the need for parasiticides and the need to protect their cats. And you won't convert everybody else, uh, everybody on the first conversation. It takes repetition, it takes time. But if you put in the effort, then you will succeed. And the biggest thing I find is one is we've got to get our staff educated. 
we got to re-educate our staff on a regular ongoing basis. You always have staff turnover. You always have message drift. You've got to reset your messages with your staff at least once or twice a year. Um, you know, I always give uh, staff key questions leading to product recommendations, and it's big, it's important to have recommendations, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But lastly, you know, I'll educate clients any way I can, and we can do seasonal emails, reminders, you know, uh, Facebook, Instagram, you name it, try it, see what it, see how it works for you. And if it works, continue with it and then measure your compliance every six months. But the bottom line is we as veterinarians need to make a recommendation. This was a study done by VCA. They, they, they surveyed over 4,000 clients and asked them, why did you choose this product? Number one reason, 72% respondents said, because my veterinarian recommended it. Unfortunately, I'm all over the country. I hear I hear veterinarians say, well, I really don't like to make a recommendation when it comes to parasiticides. I like to give my clients a choice. Well, I disagree with that. You give a client a choice, all we do is confuse them. And when you confuse them, they tend to end up leaving without a product. And so you're not providing the protection they need. And then often you get a fax from someone like Chewy or Pet Med Express for a product that you would recommend or carry yourself. And um, and the reason that you're getting a fax for that product is because that's because they're willing to tell them what to use when we're not. And so we sh we as, as veterinarians should be making the recommendation. Parasiticide should be considered a medical recommendation. Um, and I have veterinarians say to me, well, I don't want to feel like a salesman. Well, really, we are salesmen. We sell one thing. It's called knowledge. And it's knowledge on how best to work up a cat with liver disease, or it's knowledge in which parasiticides are in the best interest for our client to use. Because we know that cat, we know that client, we know their lifestyle, we should be making a recommendation. That's our job. That's why they've come to us. Um, SIVA did a study. They said that they found that 82% of, of, of clients rely on their veterinarian to determine what heartworm preventive brand to use, and 76% of clients will give whatever their vet recommends. Bottom line, give a recommendation. That's what your clients are there for. Um, I've got some compliance slides in here that I've got to put in because this was um, this was sponsored by Merck. So that's the slides for that. Um, but I'm going to finish up just pointing you to our website. So this is the CAPC website. So the top left is capcvet.org. That's the veterinarian site. Anyone's welcome to go to it. That's where our maps are. We got petsandparasites.org. That's our website for the consumers. That's client facing. It's a little bit easier for them to understand. And then lastly, the bottom one is our new website, petdiseasealerts.org. That's where we are forecasting local prevalence 30 days in advance on the county level, Lyme, Elikia, Anaplasma, and Heartworm. We can also sign up for alerts for uh, if you've got dogs, if there's an uh, outbreak for canine flu or leptospirosis in your county as well. That being said, I'll finish it up and we'll open it up for, for questions. I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention. And then I'll put this slide up here as well and I'll turn it over to Steve. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Pryor. Great, that's the thing about virtual, you can only imagine the applause, but <laughs> you heard mine anyway. A great presentation, of course. Uh, I've, I've heard you talk about this sort of thing before. Are you ready for questions? Absolutely, let's go for it. Okay, so the first question isn't to you, it's to everyone. Have you at least considered, I hope you have, uh, giving something, anything to the Every Cat Health Foundation? Uh, October <coughs> is for Cats Month, uh, and Dr. Pryor, if I tell you something, you promise not to tell anyone? Sure. <laughs> Just a secret between me and you? Sure. Okay, so every month we focus, every not every month, every October, Cures for Cats Month. The third Thursday, I believe, in that month is every cat, uh, Cures for Cats Day. And we focus on something that we feel we can make a difference. Uh, of course, we've done this for FIP a couple of times, but for other things as well, kidney disease. Well, this year it's going to be heart disease, uh, hypertrophic awesome. cardiomyopathy. Awesome. Which occurs way too often, right? And, yes. and pretty much lots of what we know, if not everything we know about HCM, as it's called, uh, was once funded by uh, Every Cat Health Foundation. It's been said that this heart disease kills more adult cats between the ages of about two to three to the age of about 10 or 11 than anything else. 
anything else. And then, you know, once they get older, we're talking kidney disease and cancers maybe taking over, but still it's prevalent. So we want to do something about it, but can't do that without your help. So we hope you tune in in October for more. But in the meantime, we have a specific fund called the Ricky Fund that raises money for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we'll certainly have some talks on that coming up. All right, let's get to some questions here. All the products you presented, have they been tested for cats? And are they safe for cats, for fanciers, for people to breed cats? No, not for the fanciers themselves, but for their cats. Yes, yeah, so, so the main product we talked about here was Brevecto Plus, and they did extensive testing on it. There's millions of doses actually being uh, already prescribed out there, and they have found no contraindications for this product. So yes, it's a very, very safe product. Um, and you've got to look at two, there's two molecules in there. Moxidectin has been used for over 10 years in just the US, and it's been used longer than that worldwide. Uh, very, very safe molecules. So yes, I would feel very, you know, if I if I was breeding cats, I would be using them. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a comment actually from Sweden saying, I didn't get all the answers to your questions right, because in Sweden, the answers are a little different. So I, I love that. I don't know. I don't know if they have a year round tick problem in Sweden. Perhaps so, they there's, don't. there's a lot of regionality. I mean, parasites are, uh, you know, you, you look worldwide, we got different parasites in different areas of the world. But Even all... different areas of the U.S., which is my next right. question. So you right. go to the pet store online or in a brick and mortar pet store, and you look for a product that you've heard about, maybe on a radio commercial, maybe on a television commercial, maybe in a print ad, maybe you've used that product before, maybe it has a Maine Coon, and you love Maine Coons, it has Maine Coon on the packaging, and that's attractive, or maybe it's on sale. Or maybe it's at just the right height at your eye level and you can't even reach the one that's way up there. Tell me about the right way to, to make decisions about using tick products and why everything I just said is the wrong way, including it may not even be applicable to your geographic part of the country. And I believe what? that question could go for dogs as well as cats. It does. It does absolutely go for dogs as well as cats. And, and so the biggest thing is that, you know, a lot of the products we're seeing, what we call OTC over the counter now, are often products that we were using 10 years ago in veterinary medicine that I don't carry in my clinic anymore because we know that there's some, a lot of these products have stress molecules. And when I talk about a stress molecule, it means it's just not as effective as it was that when it first came out in the 1990s, it was a highly effective molecule that did what it was meant to do. But now we're seeing that fleas and maybe ticks just aren't dying as well with it. And so, you know, it's been, we've moved, you know, we as a veterinarian have, have moved away from using them and we're using better, newer products out there. And so these products have found a new niche, which is the over the counter. And so, you know, there's there's people that we routinely see come in. I own three emergency clinics. People would really routinely come in in the middle of the night saying, my cat's seizuring, what's going on? And you find out that they had seen a tick or seen some fleas on it and they just go to the pet store and grab something and put it on. And then, and then you find out that it was a dog product and it's toxic to cats. You know, your best resource is your veterinarian. They are the local experts. They are the ones that keep up with what these molecules are, what the research is on it, what the published papers are, are on them. And so they can be the ones that will best advise you of what to use based upon your geographic area or if you're traveling, because people travel with their pets now. And so you may be in some area of the country, like you could be in Sweden and you're gonna go down to Italy for, for you know a, the summer and you take your dog with you. Well, should you be concerned? Yes, leishmaniasis occurs on the Mediterranean coast of Italy and is spread by sand flies. If you don't know that, then you don't know how to protect your pets. And the same thing happens in the US as well, that you've got regionality of parasites or diseases and you need to know what's there. So you need to know how best to protect your pet. Your veterinarian is the local expert and they carry the uh, what really the best products out there and the safest products. Okay. Uh Great answer, but you and I have talked about that issue before, I know. 
Um, yes. Rebecca, are, are you pregnant? No, I no. read that wrong. Hold it. I, I read <laughs> I'm that not, wrong. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, clarification, I'm not pregnant. <laughs> can Rebecca be used on pregnant cats? Um, I know it can be used in pregnant dogs, and I can't remember whether the testing or not on pregnant cats. I would have to, uh, if we can hold that one and we can email an answer to that. Okay. I think, I think that the, I'm not sure on that answer. I think it's been tested, but I can't, I can't say for sure. Okay. So okay. maybe Virginia, our superstar can get yes. the email address for Sharon. I believe is the one who asked that question. Yeah. And, and we'll follow up on that and be happy to, right. to get that answer for you. Right. Um, we know there are heartworm tests for dogs. What about cats? Louise wants to know. Yes, there are heartworm tests for cats, and you know it's the, the, there's a little bit of um, angst about that because there's some um, there's there's a little you know it's a very muddy area, so you got feeling antibody tests and feeling antigen tests, and so is it exposure? Is it actually infection? And so you know there's a uh, th there's a, a lot of research still going on how to refine these tests, get them more accurate. Uh, so can't, some cats have been exposed to it, aren't, aren't actually clinical or don't have adult worms. Some cats do. Uh, so it's it's a little bit of a muddy area, but you can you can test for cats and you should be. You know, before we go, I, I was talking about feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's a long name, isn't it? That's the kind it's of heart disease. Yeah, it is. The kind of heart disease I was talking about. That is the number one cause of sudden death in cats. And in truth, we don't know how often it happens, but there's still a percent of the population has outdoor cats. They don't come back. We don't know why necessarily. Could be the cat was lost, attacked by another animal, maybe picked up by a good Samaritan who takes that cat in himself or herself, who knows? But it could be that that cat died of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the number one cause of sudden death in cats. Along the lines of this talk and also feline heartworm, what is the number two cause of sudden death in cats? I'd say it had to be heartworms. Right, right. And we so, probably, you know, and a lot of those cats, you, again, you don't know that's, unless you do an autopsy, you don't know that that's it. But, you know, I've had numerous cases of sudden death in cats, and the clients have asked me to autopsy the cats. It's turn, turned out to be heartworms. Exactly, exactly. And uh, if you can briefly talk about how, Yes, absolutely. Heartworm in dogs is awful, you know, and the heartworm load can be hundreds of, of heartworm. Imagine that in the respiratory system of your dog. No wonder why your dog isn't feeling well. And no wonder why your dog may suffer severe, in some cases, effects as a result of that. And lifelong only... long effects. Well, okay, so that's a good point to talk about. Recent research has suggested that even when treated in dogs, and even when treated the best they can in cats, uh, you can't be cured in cats, but you could treat the symptoms or the effects of it right. uh, or the signs. Um, still, in cats and dogs, and you can do this far better than I ever could, I, I believe science is now showing there are lifetime effects as a result. Yes, you know, you, you got, so you could consider the heart of a cat is, you know, this size, it's small. And we're talking about a worm that's 12 to 14 inches long. Where's it going to be? It's wrapped up in the heart, in the valves, it gets into the lungs. And, you, you know, it, it, it's no wonder you get sudden death. I mean, you got a, what you otherwise thought was a normal healthy cat running around the house playing and suddenly it just falls over and it's gone. Um, but then you've got the damage it does to the lungs and it's, you know, the, the, the worm is actually in the vessel. So, you know, what happens when a heartworm dies? It goes in the vessels of the lungs further down because that's where they live anyway, but it just goes further down the vessels of the lungs. There's no way to eliminate it. The body has to then break it down, but it's blocking up the arteries, the arterioles, and is creating this massive inflammatory reaction there. And so you get changes in the vessels, you get changing in the lung parenchyma, and it just, it creates this damage that for a lot of cats and a lot of dogs will be there for the rest of their life. 
and there's no way to reverse it. It's just, it is what it is, you know? Well, of course, there's a way to prevent it, which is, you know, why you're here talking. I have one more question. Uh, should cats be tested annually for heartworm? What's your opinion? There are different, differing opinions on that, um, but CAPC uh, does recommend uh, testing before starting heartworm prevention in the sign of clinical disease. And we're probably going to see some changes where it's, you know, I, I think it, it, it depends on what area of the country you're in, but there is some, probably some good reason to start thinking that we should start testing annually in, in certain areas. Okay. Pets and parasites org. That's the website, Companion Animal Parasite Council, an organization that's just done so much good. Yes, sir. Hey, one last thing, just for our, our European people, um, there are maps coming to Europe. Um, CAPC is going to start, uh, we're, we're looking at providing the European CAPC their, their maps as well. We won't host them, they'll be hosted separately, but they will be actually able to start providing, they can start with Germany. So. There, there will be prevalence maps coming in the future to, to Europe, which will be wonderful because it'll help you see what the risks are in certain areas. Well, we want to know Sweden for sure. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pryor. You are My great. Pleasure. It was a great presentation. Uh, you know, the thing is about websites, there are so many with misinformation. So petsandparasites.org, but I would hope that every cat.org is one you can go to as well where you get. Uh, the straight information on what's happening in the cat world, recent studies that have been funded by this non-for-profit on behalf of the Every Cat Health Foundation, Merck Animal Health, the Cat Fanciers Association, the International Cat Association, and most of all, Dr. Craig Pryor, I thank you all very much. Thank you all for having me.